year to year. Um, the timing of them is such that as you refer to the budget considerations are kind of very high uh, in our figuring. The timing of the new water power was specifically timed due to the retirement of certain debts. If you look in the very last page, you'll see there was a drop of $100,000 in the uh, debt service last year. Or actually, it's in this coming year, which is why we timed the construction of the new water tower. We did a, a feasibility study back in 1998 that said, yes, you need a third water tower. Had we done it then, our debt service would have taken a huge jump. What we tried to do was kind of level the, level the debt service. And actually, if you look at that last table on the last page, it does actually show uh, a debt service with all the projects we've proposed in here, and then a debt service due to the new camp only in the, in, the, in the last two columns of that uh, table. And that's specifically with the knowledge that at some point, we may make a decision to let some of these projects sit off for another year so that we don't have a big spike uh, that, would, that would necessitate a rate increase. Now that's not to say that we're not going to have need for a rate increase within the next year or next 10 years. Um, but what we're trying to do in the capital plan is also recognize that by timing capital projects properly, we're not going to have huge jumps from year. Right. And, and I, I looked at that schedule. I think it, it, this is great. We need this throughout town on everything. But I, I guess I'm just trying to get to the question of is there something we're put, we've been putting off and we keep putting off and we're doing it for too long. I just, is, is it, so you're comfortable with, with the, the In my tenure with the town, and I think before I started here, Dave, Dave really initiated this capital plan. The town has been fairly aggressive in terms of bringing the water system from what might have been a, a neglected sister in town up to fairly state-of-the-art system. Um, and now we're trying to kind of, you notice that the big projects, the, the third water tower is kind of the final big project we envision. Uh, the water treatment plant rehabilitation, the construction of the new water treatment plant, the cleaning and lining of all the water meters that took place before, and even the water meter replacement back in the early 90s. I mean, those were all kind of high priority things that were front, front loaded on the capital plan. It, it did have an impact on our rates at the time, obviously, as we went from one of the lower rate communities to where we are now, one of the higher rate communities. So we're trying to get as much as we can done without having much more of an impact on, on people's uh, income or disposable income. Uh, just, uh, Mr. Martin. So one more question and then a comment. Um, on the bedrock well project, um, in in the phase two, it, in in the summary description, it, it, it makes the comment. <coughs> and I paraphrase, but does not change what we can draw, but it but it alters future operations, maintenance, and costs. And then in the in the third project, which is the installation of the bedrock well, again going back to it doesn't change what we can draw from Ipswich <coughs> River. But yet, there's a reference to the water purchase from Andover, and I'm having in, the, in Project Three. And so, it, in my own in my own mind, I'm I'm having trouble understanding if we can't, you know, it'd be nice if we could use the bedrock well to draw enough to get rid of the Andover purchase, but we can't do that. And I, having taken the tour with with you folks and talked a lot about the issue, I understand that. But help me. Help me bring sure. those two issues together, and then if you could on the co maintenance and cost, help me understand the, okay. the maintenance and cost impact of the bedrock well versus the gravel well. Okay. The, this, we looked at about 13 sites throughout town that potentially could support high production bedrock wells. Um, three of them happen to be relatively close to our Central Street pumping station, which is across the street from the, uh, the Little League fields for those of you who haven't been up there. Um, the obvious advantage is that Dave and, I, Dave and I did a matrix after getting this, this report from the consultants and said, you know, we rated, rated distance to, to uh, power, distance to existing water system, distance to existing treatment facilities. The locations around the Central Street well, for obvious reasons, came up number one or number two in basically everything that we rated them on. Um, Central Street wells, it's what's called a tubular well field. They're small two and a half inch diameter wells that sit down in the sand. If you can think about the well, its capacity to instantaneously draw water is fairly 
closely related to the diameter of that well itself. Now those are two and a half inch wells. Um, we can't at this point go back and put larger wells in there because the tubular wells have a smaller protective zone around them than a, than a larger well would require. Subsequently, there are homes closer to those wells that we couldn't go to a larger well. The bedrock wells at that location, uh, the, the, I'm getting ahead of myself, the two and a half inch wells, once you clean them, which is about a once a year uh, basis for us, their actual production capacity almost instantaneously starts to decrease. You might get, say, 10 gallons per minute per foot of drawdown in those wells when they've first been cleaned. And within a month, you might be down to seven gallons a minute and then down to five gallons a minute. The benefit of the bedrock wells is theoretically that production that you're able to uh, initially develop would stay much longer. You wouldn't have that quick drop-off period. So that that directly relates to how much water we could buy from Andover. If you can produce at a higher rate and still be under what the uh, still be drawing the set, okay. Is, that's that's where we potentially could draw <coughs> the water. So it's a it's, it, it's a balancing not, right exactly. We're still not right. likely to be able to draw. <coughs> But because our wells tail off, we don't we don't currently draw up what we're allowed to. So what we're trying to do is close that gap. So we're not hitting maximum capacity. We're not we're not able to because our wells because of the well limitation. Exactly. Right. Oh, um, great. That's now in great terms of the operation and maintenance costs, um, obviously the cleaning of the wells, you have to take the wells out of service while you clean them. We have to do it on an annual basis. Uh, it might be beneficial to look at doing it actually more frequently than that. But there, it's fairly labor intensive and cost intensive to maintain those wells. There are treatment considerations with the wells. Uh, currently, because the Central Street wells are not a filtered source, they do have some iron and manganese in the wells, and we're trying to provide everyone with the highest quality water we can. We do have a, an interconnection with Andover at that site, which has basically no iron and manganese coming into it. We don't operate the Central Street wells unless that handover interconnection is operating. So we're blending that water to give it a higher quality water. Um, theoretically, and again, it's going to depend on testing of any bedrock wells we put, but you could get a different quality water coming from a bedrock well than a sandy gravel well. It might be might be much lower iron and manganese, might be a different pH. It, chemical makeup could just be coming from a different, uh, you know, because it's coming from rock instead of sandy gravel, it could just be different. So the operation characteristics and the, the costs associated with it could be could be beneficial to the town. Good. Thank you. And just one comment. I yep. took a tour of all those facilities a while back with, with Dave and met all the staff. And, uh, so yep. it's quite, a, Thank you. quite an interesting yep, process. It is. It is. Uh, learned more than probably I want to know. You want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for answering those yep. questions. Just a moment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I only have one one question. Actually, it's from the FY204 budget. Uh, the project number two backwash holding tank lakeside refers to pressure fluctuations because of the backwashing and that you would like to build a, a tank to use the water. And that tank would cost about $310,000. Um, can you get into the details of a little bit of that, and especially, you have a statement here, this has long been a source of concern to consumers in the area, so in in what way does the lack of pressure cause problems for the people, how long, how widespread is it? Okay, the, the lakeside wells are, uh, it's our second oldest well field, it's lo located on the side of Martin's Pond. Um, you think about the way the wells work. Uh, these wells pump through what's called green sand filters. The green sand filters take out iron and manganese, but what it does is it concentrates the iron and manganese inside those filters, and they're almost like a big swimming pool filter where they, they take it out and you get a, a pressure loss developing over the filters as they get dirtier. Um, what you have to do is periodically backwash those filters, and what that involves is basically reversing the flow, pumping it. If the water's flowing top to bottom, now you're pumping it bottom to top, just like your swimming pool with backwash, and it's taking all that material out and uh, cleaning the filters. And we do that to two different filters there on a daily basis. Um, so what we're doing on a normal basis is we're pumping water from the wells to the system. It's flowing primarily down Lakeside Boulevard, out Barrows Road, and towards Main Street. Um, when we backwash the filters, we're basically drawing water 
from the Moose Hill Tank or from Main Street back down Barbers Road, back up the Lakeside Boulevard into those filters. When the, when the wells are online pumping to the system, we're pumping out at about 90 or 95 pounds per square inch. When we're back washing, we're pumping back in at about 50 to 60 pounds per square inch. So on a daily basis, what we're doing is pushing water this way down Lakeside Boulevard at 95, then turning it around for about 20 minutes, pulling it back at 50 to 60 PSI. People in the neighborhood, they know pretty much, okay, at 7.30, these guys are gonna come, they're gonna do one of the backwashes, then at 8.30, they're gonna do another backwash. So they've kind of learned, you know, to time their lives a little bit around us. What we did at the new treatment plant, because the new treatment plant is fairly remote from any of our towers or any of the sources and would have caused fairly considerable uh, pressure fluctuations in the, in the West Village neighborhood, we actually built a uh, big holding tank. It holds about 12,000 gallons of water on site there. Uh, and what happens is after a backwash, that tank trickle fills. We fill it slowly through the course of the day. Then the next morning when we need to backwash, the filters were really drawn off that tank. We have a pump that actually pumps the water from that tank back through the filters uh, to backwash them so that there's no uh, reversal of flow in the distribution system. Um, that reversal flow is a fairly drastic thing to do to the distribution on a, on a daily basis. Luckily at Lakeside, we are relatively close to the Moose Hill tank, so there aren't huge huge distances that it does affect, but from Main Street, certainly in and around Martin's Pond, um, it, do, it does cause some pressure fluctuations. So that, that's really what this project relates to, is to basically remove that need. It's almost like opening a fire hydrant full bore out by Lakeside once, once a day, or well, twice a day for about 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. I'm all set. Okay, do we have anybody from the public? Joe. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeah, just uh, two more quick questions. <coughs> what, what growth uh, projections was this based on? And uh, well, along with that is, uh, it looks like this, you, you got this out to the year 2002, I mean 2007, and uh, will this new tank and this what you're, what you're proposing here, will that eliminate water restrictions? The new tank is likely not going to eliminate water restrictions. Um, what we've seen in the last 10 years or so is, certainly you guys who lived in town a long time ago, in the, in, well, I'm not saying a long time, but in the 1990s, you, were, you, you recall the restrictions that were in place every summer then. The town did, uh, did decide to make a connection with Andover because that really was the only viable large source of water. And if you read the paper yesterday, again, people were looking at Andover as the only uh, potentially viable source of huge amounts of water. Um, so we made the decision to make that connection in the uh, in the 1990s. When we took away the, the annual summer bans, then growth started in town. And if you look at the kind of growth that's occurred since then, there are fairly large homes with fairly large lawns, and there are people who are irrigating those lawns on a daily basis. Our summer water demands can be three and a half times what they are in the winter time. Um, even with our Andover connections wide open, it's difficult for us to meet those type of demands. So if we get a, a week of extended weather, it's, it's very difficult to meet those demands. And if I look at my top probably 20 customers of demand in here on the residential side, those homes have all, I've been here seven years, those homes have probably all been built since I came here. If I look at, in fact, I was looking at it today, the top three Commercial demands are all the, ter the three new Teradyne buildings. So if you look at the demands in town, they're going up. Teradyne is kind of a good demand because it's fairly consistent through the year. We want to sell more water, especially during the non-peak periods of the year, because that's that is revenue to us. But, but the the peaking factors, especially from the lawn sprinkling in the summer, they're just something that we can't keep up with, even with our Andover engine connection. So it's it's unlikely that the uh, the water bands are going to go away at any time. Okay. Any other questions? With what? What growth projections did you base these on? I mean, is this how many new homes in the next 10 years, 20 years, or what? what? Well, the, the, the debt numbers in the back, they don't really relate to how many new homes. They just relate to what would be the cost of, you know, for $2 million for a new tank. No, I mean, I mean in the front. We've got this, you've got this projected out as far as uh, the studies and so on and so forth, the year 2000 and, uh, 2007. What, what I'm asking is, What's going to happen in 2008? Are we going to need twice as much 
water as we need now? You know, what, in other words, you figure this is going to take us. This is what you're going to need to take us out to 2007. Right. You know, how many new homes between now and 2007? And right. you know, that's maybe the you understand what I'm asking. Master plan 